Um, I, I plan to not to steal too much of the lunch time this time, so I'm going to keep it a bit short. I actually um, thought of dividing the experimental uh, approaches to, to this field into two different talks. So today I will focus more on um, what, are, what are called uh, fast and ultra fast spectroscopic techniques, and then tomorrow I will have a look uh, more at the relatively slow um, experimental techniques. So um, basically what one could say is the techniques of today are going to focus more on dynamical disorder in the system. Tomorrow's experimental techniques focus a bit more on static disorder. Okay, so the idea of, of these lectures was that um, all of them are building up um, on one another. So experimental techniques I selected um, are specifically to, to understand the modeling aspects better. So um, the, these techniques, or the results of these techniques are actually used to, to calibrate the model which we have developed yesterday. Um, because these, these systems are extremely complex systems, they, there's a whole array of different experimental techniques that are out there and that are available. And um, most of the advances are actually to combine some of these techniques um, and to develop the new techniques so that you can every time get new information. Because every technique gives you a different angle um, on the system that you're um, investigating. Okay. So the complete picture of course you get if you are combining the lines and techniques together. So the idea is um, to give you more a uh, conceptual an idea of, of the different techniques that can be used and not necessarily focus on the details and the complexities and challenges of the techniques. Okay, so let's kick off basically where we stopped yesterday. Um, and you know, one important thing I wanted you to remember about the, the modeling which we developed yesterday is the different uh, limits of station energy transfer in these systems. So we first look at the, the limit of weak intermolecular coupling. Um, so this is the uh, Interaction potential is much smaller than the difference between the, the two dying, the two dipoles, which we considered. Okay. And this would be the case: um, small interaction energy between the molecules with respect to the environment, um, and then also with respect to the physical energy difference between the two. So in this case, uh, you would expect that. Uh, the, the dynamics to be described by first uh, resonance energy transfer, so energy is transferred in a resonant way. Okay. In the other extreme, the other limit, uh, energy transfer is described by a red field modeling, so this is a strong molecular coupling regime. Okay. And there we have, instead of localized um, excited states that are um, exchanging by means of resonance, we now have delocalized excitations essentially delocalized over all the interacting pigments. So then um, energy transfer happens in a coherent fashion. Okay. For most systems we're actually in between for light halves and complexes. Okay, so now to um, yeah I, I thought of trying to, to make it a bit more interactive. So in the spirit of the school, here's a question for you. So which of these two models do you expect? It gives the largest energy transfer rate when both V, the intermolecular coupling, and delta, the energy difference, are small. Okay, and who votes for first the resonance? Okay, we have one end. Uh, why do you say so? Why? <laughs> you, you, you did not attend yesterday's talk, so it will be interesting to hear your answer. My knowledge of firstly the energy transfer is that it's a relatively efficient process. So, um, for small energy differences. That's, uh, that's all I know about it. So. Okay, but isn't red field also efficient? Okay. <laughs> now, we'll for two.
think so, because in this regime, rate of theory gives us an artifact. Well, to give you a clue, um, Furster is a special case of rate fields, but not the other way around. And another important aspect to remember is Furster describes coherent energy transfer, excitons, delocalized states. And why is this important? Well, these states are significantly enhancing energy transfer. So, with this which I've said, one would expect that first, uh, first uh, special case of rate field, and it's not dealing with excitons. If you are dealing with excitons, the rate should always be faster or equal to, or let me say, the rate produced by the rate of mass should also always be faster or equal to the first. But never the other one. So, let me show this in the picture. Okay, so we have the energy transfer rate as a function of the interaction energy, so V, and the energy gap, so delta. And the top surface uh, represents the rate according to, or predicted by rate field theory, and the bottom one predicted by first theory. So you can see that in this regime, there's small interaction energy and large energy gaps, the two are the same. So this is the resonance regime. So when the diameters are far enough apart, so that you only have dipole the dipole interaction, okay, and localization of your excitations. As soon as they come closer together, the excited state will be delocalized. Okay, so um, okay, let's look at enlarged interaction energies. So for all energy gaps. Um, okay. In this case, you have delocalization, so the exciton states, rate of field is this much faster transfer rate than first field. Okay. But now the question was in this regime so small detection energy, small energy gaps. Okay. And this is, well, okay. again, first theory for these faster rates. But this is due to an artifact. It's because um, it's not within the regime of, of red fields. Um, so we are like in a regime where these two rates are equal and then it gives rise to, to artifacts. So that's why um, other uh, theoretical approaches should be used in this regime. Um, let me show it in this way as well. So we have different coupling strengths. The transfer rate is a function of the energy gap. So in this case, the rate foot rate is above and the first rate is at the bottom. Okay, and you can see, okay, especially if the energy gap decreases between the two, the rate predicted by, by rate foot theory becomes um, much larger than the first rate. In the case of the energy gap, um, a very large thing resonance uh, energy transfer dominant. Now in this regime, so very small energy gaps, very small coupling. Uh, these very large rates produced by rate field are unrealistically large. So this is something that's been dealt with. I've also shown here the purple or magenta curves of the delocalization length. So this is now the case for two chlorophylls. Delocalization length describes basically the, the length of the excitation. So if it's one, it's localized on one chlorophyll in this case. If it's two, it's delocalized over both. And okay, this is then directly related for uh, correspond very well to the transfer rates. Okay, so keep this in mind just for the rest of this talk. Okay, we are looking now at photosystem two. Okay, in, in the center um, of the core antenna system, so D1 and D2 are the reaction centers core antenna systems, the minor lighthouse complex is in red, and then LHG2, the major lighthouse complex in green. So normally what happens if you would excite one of the antenna systems, you first have energy equilibration within one of the antenna systems. So this is mainly described by red field theory, delocalization, because of very strong coupling between amongst all the pigments. Okay, and then from there you have like a resonance hopping energy transfer until the excitation reaches the reaction center, which 
the energy is simply stored as a charge separated state. Okay, so let's look at LHC2 and some important experimental techniques that have been used uh, and important information we need in order to calibrate the red fields model. Okay. So the first thing that one needs is the crystal structure. So this gives up the orientations and the distances of all the different chlorophyll pigments. And especially we are interested in um, getting to know the dipole moments. Um, if you know the dipole moments and you know the um, orientation distances, you can tell the interaction energy between all the different pigments in the system. Okay, so this is the first thing we need. The second one is we want to calculate the spectral density of some thermal coupling because this will give us information about the spectral dynamic properties. And this is measured and is calculated by using one of two techniques or combination of both spectral hole burning and resonance line narrowing. So basically, how this works. Okay. Uh, normally in an absorption spectrum you have homogeneous broadening and inhomogeneous broadening. Inhomogeneous broadening is a um, type of broadening experienced by um, or experienced in a different way by all the different pigments in the system. And this is normally much broader, especially in a disordered environment, like a protein environment. It is highly time dependent. So as a function of time, um, the, the site energies of the pigments will change. It, they will change quite significantly. So this will um, broaden your absorption there very much. But homogeneous broadening, that's a type of broadening experienced by all the pigments in a similar way. So the most important broadening, as we looked at yesterday, is um, spontaneous emission. Okay, it's a probability approach and you expect a Lorentzian profile from that. Okay, so there are two ways in which you can get information about the homogeneous broadening. Because normally it is hidden in the broad band of your homogeneous broadening. Okay, the one is called spectral hole burning. So, suppose in this example that there are three pigments, each with a different site energy that are um, giving rise to this inhomogeneous and broadened peak. Okay, now if you selectively excite one of these um, pigments and with a very high laser irradiations, then you can bleach this pigment and you can get rid of this, this band. Okay, so how you, your, um, your absorption band will now look like, or look like it has a hole inside, and then it also normally has a small corresponding absorption band. Of course, if you bleach your pigment, you um, you do something with this um, electronic structure. So this is a photoproduct that's created that has different spectral properties. Okay, and so by doing this, so it's selectively bleaching the different bands, you can get different holes in the spectrum, and this will give you information about uh, this homogeneous line corresponding to each um, individual pigment. Okay, the other way of getting information about this is called resonance line narrowing. Okay, the extent of broadening depends very much on the temperature. The higher the temperature, the more thermal energy the system has. So the more, um, the, the, the broader the, 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 you know, the, the width of the absorption band is. Okay. You can think of this as a, a time dependence of your of the transition light at the moment. Okay. So the absorption rate is um, yeah, dependent on the interaction between light and the external electric field that you are applying. You have seen that this uh, depends on the specific line shape function. This line shape okay, is normally describing the homogeneous and the inhomogeneous broadening. Okay. As we have seen, inhomogeneous broadening is mainly the time dependence. So if we are decreasing the temperature, we will limit the, uh, especially the phonon motions. We, we will start to freeze out many of the phonon motions. So electron phonon coupling will be decreased significantly. The second width will decrease very much. 
And this way you can basically get rid of most of the inhomogeneous polynomial and end up with only the homogeneous um, line width. Okay. And then you are um, selectively exciting these different <coughs> pigments that you can also get information about the, um, the homogeneous lines. Okay, so to, if you want to put this in the, in the model, so here are two line shapes, absorption and fluorescence. Okay, in terms of your uh, transition dipole moment, the population rate, of course, of all the different um, excitons. Okay, and in the exciton representation of the absorption and fluorescence, we have the um, inner broadening and we have the, the line bits and the number. And these are all expressed in terms of spectral density. So essentially if you know the spectral density and you know the site energies, you can calculate the absorption of present spectra. So these are two essential ingredients to, to calibrate the, the, the model. Okay, the third one we need to know is the site energies. Okay. And we can get information about this in this complex system but by means of combination of different experimental techniques combined with the model. So we simultaneously want to fit the spectra which were obtained from different experimental techniques. And these are six types of spectra that have been fitted simultaneously um, in order to get a unique model for all the different site energies in LH2. Okay, so First of all, linear spectra, fluorescence and absorption, and linear diaprism and circular diaprism. I think the latter two have been mentioned in, in some of the, the lectures. I don't want to elaborate on it too much. Linear diaprism is a difference in absorption. Um, uh, alpha parallel and perpendicular components. Where circular diaprism describes the difference in absorption between um, left circular polarized light, right circular polarized light. Okay. This talk I want to elaborate more on pump probe spectroscopy. These are techniques in which you can get a significant amount of information from these light harvesting systems. Okay. But in order to get information about site energies, two different excitation wavelengths are <coughs> used. The wavelengths for the pump B. Okay, so looking at the absorption spectrum of LH2, here are all the different site energies corresponding to 14 chlorophylls in one monomeric subunit of the trial. Okay, 650 nanometers is somewhere in the middle of chlorophyll B QY absorption. So then you are selectively exciting the chlorophyll B pigments. 662 nanometers is at the blue edge of this for A, QY band, and then you are exciting the, the blue shifted chlorophyll A pigment. So you would expect different excitation dynamics because of these selective excitations. Okay, so simultaneous fits all these different spectra, we are using the crystal structure, and as we have noted in previous lectures, they are forming some, some clusters which are strongly coupled and some weak, more, uh, more weakly coupling between the different clusters. Okay, so these uh, spots refer to the, the central atoms in the rings of the chlorophylls which give us the main transition dipole moments of pigments. Okay, so the dots are the experimental points, the lines are the, the model. Fits. Okay, transient absorption at 650 nanometers uh, trans absorption at 662 nanometers, uh, different delay times, so I'll never do this later. The, the fit might not look perfect to you, but um, thinking about the conditions, it, it's actually a very good fit. Because the, the model that was used was only a, a monomer model that was fitted on the whole trimer or data of the trimer. Okay. And uh, you have to make some approximations, of course of the complexity of the system. So actually this fit is very good and this uniquely identified all the different site images in the system. Okay. So what um, does the model tell us about energy transfer in the system? 
upon excitation of any of the chlorophylls in the system, okay, so all, all these chlorophylls are labeled 601, 602, 603, um, up to 614, 613, 614. So upon excitation of each one of them, you can trace how the energy flows within the system. So the the paths and the, the time scales of energy transfer. So let's start, for example, at the bluemost um, state. So again, the axis is, is uh, the energy. Okay, so upon the station of protocol B606, um, this one is part of a cluster of three protocol Bs um, together with one protocol A. Protocol A is significantly redshifted, so you would expect first excitation equilibration amongst the chlorophyll Bs they are strongly coupled so they will form some strong exciton states and then on a bit smaller time scale we would expect the chlorophyll A site to be populated so this is what we see the size of the circles correspond to um, the probability amplitude having the excitation on that specific period so first um, uh, the exciton is shared amongst the three chlorophyll Bs, okay, and then on a slow time scale, it's equilibrated on chlorophyll 6 of 4. So this has a lower exciton state, so we would expect that it will have most of the oscillator strength, so most of the excitation will end up there. Okay, so the same can be, do, can be done for the other clusters, starting with the blue most chlorophyll in this cluster, 6 of 8, for example, and we can follow the energy transfer. And Especially from this cluster here, um, because it is it's relatively close to the, the, the red most cluster, so 601 and 2, it's one of the red growth A clusters, and you have 602, 603, and 6, 614, 613. So you have energy transfer from this cluster to these clusters, and in the end, the, in the, the energy in the system is equilibrated on the lowest piston states. Which are in 610, is sharing 610 and 612. Okay, so this is information the world provides to us, which is actually fascinating. On, on these time scales, we can trace how the energy flows around in the whole system. Okay, and this is just another example of how we can follow the energy transfer. So it gives us the exciton populations, the number of exciton states. So this is now in the whole triangle which contains 42 pigments and it's a function of the time so we are exciting uh, one of the bees and you have very fast equilibration within the cluster and then the energy flows to the other clusters and they end up on the 6, 10 and four, which I have shown here in the previous slide ok, let's have a look at the main technique called pump probe spectroscopy function absorption spectroscopy just to um, appreciate maybe some of the complexities in this okay. it's just another representation of exciting any of these pigments uh, we can maybe um, unravel how the energy will flow within the system until it ends on one of the three lowest digital states okay yeah so before I go to the pump pro spectroscopy and the previous model was done for only one monomeric subunit, later it was extended to the whole triangle. So after equilibration within one of the monomeric subunits, you can then trace the energy flow to the other monomer, to the other monomers, and until the energy has equilibrated within the whole triangle. Okay. So here's an example of how it was done for a, a very nice symmetric system. It's called a bacterial white house in complex 2. So these are the very nice rings and white house complex 1. They um, inside which the reaction center is. So normally what happens on a very fast time scale, in this case between 100 and 220 seconds, energy will migrate between these rings and equilibrate on a time scale of one, about 1 picoseconds, after which the energy will then migrate to LH1 ring and then on a bit smaller time, shorter time scale, so longer time scale, 35 picoseconds, uh, the energy will then flow into the reaction center with a 
child separated state can be created. Okay, you might now wonder um, how is it possible to measure these extremely fast timescales? We're talking about femtoseconds, picoseconds. Okay, let's have a look at different timescales. So, if you get to the millisecond timescale, that's approximately how fast the shuttle works. But electronics can get us to just below nanoseconds. But that is not fast enough. Well, in fact, the development of our understanding of um, light harvesting, especially photosynthetic light harvesting, developed very strongly with the development of the laser. So, first you had the, the Q switch laser, nanosecond laser, picosecond laser, femtosecond laser, and these days you even have the attosecond laser, although this is not really applicable for these systems. And because the, the processes are more in the order of 10, or the, the shortest process, in the order of 10 to 150 seconds. So we need a laser that is suitable for us to, to capture these dynamics. Okay. A single pulse won't help us really. So the trick to use is to use two pulses. One pulse is called the pump, and the other pulse is called the probe. And conceptually how this work is in a simplified schematic here, the femtosecond laser, it means that the pulse duration, the time width of the pulse, is in a femtosecond range. It's normally between 10 femtoseconds up to about 150 femtoseconds. Okay, so both your pump and your probe pulse. Okay, for the probe, we are using a white light continuum. So we want to probe over the whole visible region to, to look at all the dynamics that are taking place. So normally you, you use your fundamental pulse, which is normally in the infrared. You, you focus it inside a crystal and um, uh, due to a process of self modulation uh, you, you broaden this pulse, generating white light continuum. The probe. Okay, so you have the pump and the probe. The pro um, and one of them, in this setup is now the probe. The timing of this pulse can then be controlled. So we have a delay line with different time steps. The time steps are direct, directly related to, um, um, to, to the, the distance that it travels. And in this case, you, are, you can delay the pulse with respect to the pump. So the pump normally comes first, it pumps some part of the population, and then after specified time, the probe arrives at the sample, and you can see how the energy has already um, migrated in the system. So schematically it's something like this. With the pump and the probe. And then you can use a whole series of different time steps and then see after all these times um, how the energy dynamics have, has changed in the system. Okay, so of course it's directly a uh, very easy relationship between the, the change in the time and the change in the, in the distance. So we need um, a pretty large time step, so one millimeter corresponds to a time delay of three picoseconds. Okay. And something else uh, I would like to note here is that okay, we can't use infinitely narrow um, bandwidth together with very short pulses. It's because of Heisenberg's uncertain principle. So if you are using transform limited pulses, Okay, you can calculate what is the, sh um, the smallest bandwidth you can get together with a certain pulse duration. Okay, normally with these femtosecond pulses, so we are talking about say about 10 femtoseconds, your bandwidth is restricted to more or less 10 nanometers. Okay, so this is then the, the resolution that we have. Okay, so how does from probes um, or how do the signals look like which we measure? Okay. We are using um, probe. Um, oh, okay, let me start here. We are using different absorption spectra. Okay, so in the one case, you are only measuring the probe. So this is now with the pump off. And in the other case, you are first sending the pump through the system and then the probe. So then you can see what changes the pump has induced with respect to the probe. So this is then called the absorption of the pump on minus absorption of the pump off. And this is simply obtained by using the shutter. So the, these are um, pulsed 
um, or that the pulses arrive at um, certain frequencies, repetition rates, then you with a synchronizing the shutter, uh, sorry, not shutter, the chopper, together with the, the repetition rate, you can then um, select like every other pulse of the, of, of the pump that will um, be, be chopped or that will go through to a sample. So in this, this case you can then yeah, alternatively um, get only pump on or pump off and measure the different absorption. So in the case of the pump off, we only have the probe and this is like the type of absorption spectrum that we can measure. Now, if we first shine the pump light into the sample and then the probe after it, then uh, that, the spectrum will have changed because of some spectral effects induced by the pump. Okay. Now, subtracting these two, we have a different absorption spectrum, and this is then what we see how these absor different absorption spectra change as a function of time. Okay, what are different processes that we can um, get? From, from these spectra. So actually what we are seeing is well, these are called transient absorption spectra because they show us um, transient species, transient spectral species. It's a combination of different um, processes that are taking place in the system. So the three most important ones are illustrated here. So if your um, pump comes, um, you will excite some part of your population. And now when your probe comes, there are less molecules in the, in the ground state. Okay, so pump on minus pump off will give you a negative difference at all in spectrum. This is called ground state bleaching. Because with the pump, you have decreased in population in the ground state. Okay, now if you have already populated this first excited state, then if the probe arrives, then you can excite these molecules or you can stimulate some of them uh, to go back to the ground state. So the first process is called excited state absorption. So uh, some of those um, excited states go into higher excited states. Okay, and stimulated emission is gift of fluorescence. So uh, this looks like excited state absorption is a positive peak, stimulated emission is negative. And then what we will see from the combination of these three spectral profiles is something like this. Okay. And then after some time, the process have, have developed, so um, this population has shifted, and some of some of has decayed, and yeah, some of the molecules that have gone to high excited states have also decayed, so we get different from the species again after some time. And this also results in a different transient absorption spectrum. Okay, so this can now be followed um, at many different time steps, and then of course the excitation relaxes. After many different time steps, this is typically how uh, such a, a series of pump pro data will look like. So you have your different absorption on the milli OD as a function of your delay time and the wavelength. Okay, and now the question comes in, how do you interpret these spectra? Because it's a combination of a, a whole bunch of processes that take place. I've mentioned only the three most important ones. There are also, as we've seen in the first lecture, if carotenoids are present, you have a lot of other states that can also be occupied. Many of them are dark states, but they will influence the population of the other states. Okay, and then you also have triplet state formation, uh, which is also dark state in most of these systems, you don't see the phosphorescence. So those will also influence these, these product states. Okay, so then people have developed sophisticated models to fit these data. And you get different um, compartments, say that these are the main states that are, um, that are present and that are being populated and depopulated. And I will show a few examples of those. Let's have a look at um, an example of LHC2, so we have the trimer and the monomer. Okay. And we're going to look at excitation at 489 nanometers. So this preferentially excites one of the carotenoids in the system called lutein. But of course, you have a, 
a, a limited bandwidth, so a pretty broad peak, you will also excite um, um, many other peak nodes. So most of the um, lights will result in the station of looting, but you will also excite to small probabilities of the other carotenoids and also some of the chlorophores, especially since this large peak um, corresponds to the sorry band. Just the shoulder sticking out is the result of the rotten words in the absorption spectrum of the H2. Okay, so this makes the interpretation of this data uh, even more complex. But let's have a look at it. Okay, so remember that the S0 to S1 of carotenoid is symmetry forbidden. So if we are exciting this, it's 489 nanometers, we are actually exciting the carotenoid to the S2 state. So then you can already imagine you can have decay to the S1 state and you will have transfer of the energy to chlorophores. Let's see how we can unravel some of this. Okay, so this is so-called species-associated difference absorption spectra that I've measured some time ago. Um, and it's 2 upon 489 nanometers. It means that we are dealing here with um, specific transient absorption species. So these uh, spectra that we see correspond to transient states, mixed states, so they're not pure states. I will show you in the next slide how we can um, interpret the, the pure states. Okay, so we have the different time scales here, and these correspond to time constants or decay times of all the different transient species. So, um, as soon as the laser pulse goes through the sample, okay, and it's also another point to note that the, the pro-pulse, it's a broadened pulse, but it has some churn, which means that um, you have the leading edge and the trail edge, and they, will, they can have different colors, different energies. So normally the, the, the red part will be leading, and as the... Um, oh sorry, this is the blue part. So as, as the, the pulse goes through the sample, you can actually notice how it goes through. So you will first excite the blue pigments in your system and then the red ones as the pulse goes through the, the, the system. <coughs> okay, and this is what uh, some part of which you can still see in this first spectrum. So we are mainly exciting carotenoid H2 state, so the negative different absorption spectrum here corresponds to ground state bleach. But then you also see some of these so-called coherent artifacts, which correspond to the dispersion of the, the beam through the sample or just a characteristic of your probe beam. Okay, so this trace on this spectrum decays the time constant of the 100 femtoseconds to the next one, which is the solid line. Okay, what's it's the main process that has happened? Well, the chlorophyll B and the chlorophyll A, these correspond to the QY states, they have been populated, and we have some excited state absorption corresponding to population of carotenoid S1, which has then been excited again. So we can already see that S2 has relaxed to S1, and it's relaxed to, or transferred energy to chlorophyll B and chlorophyll A. Okay, so this transient absorption species then decays to another species um, within about 600 femtoseconds, and this gives us the dotted curve. So now the carotenoid S2 has relaxed almost completely. There's still a bit of carotenoid S1 left. Carotenoid S1, from this state, there's been energy transfer to a bit to chlorophyll B, but most of it to chlorophyll A. So now chlorophyll A signal, QY signal, is a maximum. Okay, so this species is now dominated by the chlorophyll A population, ground state use this signal. Okay, this. Um, species decays then within uh, 2 picoseconds to the last one, in which there is hardly anything left of carotenoid S2, ground state bleach, excited state absorption, probably B, QY, ground state bleach is also less, and we basically only have a population of both A, which is now shifted slightly to the red, so already some e equilibration in the system has taken place. Okay, and um, Relaxation of this species is due to um, spontaneous emission, which is on a time scale of a few nanoseconds. 
So this is a very long time span. Okay. Um, now, these are species associated with different spectra. Okay. Now, in order to resolve the different species, to, to, to get a pure state, so called target analysis was employed. Okay, and um, these are the results that came out. So these timescales are different because here we have the mixed states, then we have the pure state. So we start with absorption of carotenoids, so that is two states, and then already you can see branching. So some part of the population relapses to S1, some part goes to QX, some part to QY. Okay, then S1 and then relapse back to the ground state, and QX will also um, transfer to QY and just then eventually relapse. Okay, so this is more or less how we can get information from these transit absorption spectra. Okay, and here are then several time traces of the pure species. So 680 nanometers, this is the very last one responding to QY, okay, which is populated last and has a very long um, decade time. First species correspond to 495 nanometer um, brown state bleach, which is the X2, and then we also have the side state absorption in this region, and we have the um, QX. So everything that um, we have seen before. Okay, so now we can uh, add another beam to, to this setup. And there are different variations of that. So using multiple beams, uh, one way to do it is uh, to have the timing so that the second beam... Um, okay, so you have basically two beams that are pumping or dumping the system and then eventually your probe comes. And there's a delay time between the first two, so you have the pump and the dump in this case, delay time between the first two, also delay time um, to the probe, the probe. Okay, and with the second beam you can re-pump the system to get it into another state. In this way you can um, get information about some, some other types of states, for example, charge transfer states, triplet states, you can have a look at multiphonon processes, sorry, multiphoton processes, annihilation processes, so, for example, if you have two excitations in a system, they will um, annihilate each other. You have signet signet annihilation, signet triplet annihilation, triplet triplet annihilation, so there's a whole bunch of things going on in this case. And then you can also dump some fraction of your um, side state population, and then especially how the system equilibrates. This will give more information about different exciton states in your system. Okay, so you can, in this case, this internal the dynamics are normally hidden in the broader excited state manifolds. Okay, here's one example of how this was done in a bacterial system. Okay, so we pumped some population in the ground state to the first excited state. Okay, and then after some time, we dumped part of this um, side state species, and then we, we looked at the equilibration of the system. Okay, so yeah, I1 and I2 are different intermediate states that have been resolved by dumping some part of the population. Essentially, how this works so we have pumped some part of the ground state population, and after some time, we dump part of it, and then we look at the integration of this excited state. Okay. Yeah, if there are various other things that one can also investigate with this. So, um, more advanced techniques um, would involve then, um, instead of increasing the number of different um, physical beams, uh, laser beams, you can just simply use a special light modulator with which you can form magic, so to say, which you can then um, use to divide your, your beam into many different pulses and you can also change the, the shapes, the amplitude, phase, etc. I'm going to show an example of that in a minute. Okay, so there are a few questions that have to be resolved. Some of them have been resolved. So the first question is for you. So what is the physical basis for the remarkable efficiency of photosynthetic light harvesting? Any idea? Uh, 
Yeah. So why have these uh, complexes such an extremely high efficiency of light velocity? So very fast transfer rate of the excitation in the system to the reaction center without or with negligible loss of energy. Yes, yeah. We see that under a field case and the quantum coherence can give you faster transfer rates as that boils down to the proximity of the mm. particles of activity. Yeah, that's a correct answer. Excitons. It's because of excitons. Excitons are these coherent states. Without the excitons, you would have had a very large loss of your energy. And at, and at this molar concentration, you would actually have expected no light offsing to take place, or, or no fluorescence in an isolated system. I've shown you in the first lecture because of concentration quenching. So because of excitons, the efficiency rises from about 0% efficiency to almost 100%. Okay, a few other questions. Uh, what are the molecular mechanisms of photoprotection? That's a process that has been investigated for over 20 years now and still is not conclusive. So I'm going to give a bit of information about that. Then another question, how can energy flow be manipulated? We've already seen part of this by using these multiple beam approaches. So pump dump spectroscopy, pump repump spectroscopy, in which you start to manipulate some of the energy flow. Okay, using SLMs, for example, spatial light modulators or pulse shapers, you can start to, to manipulate the flow of the energy to a much larger extent. But can this be done? Uh, in order to avoid unfavorable traps. Here I'm thinking about traps related to photoprotection. And if you remember this slide, that the maximum quantum efficiency we can get from absorption of photon until you have fixated the energy, so formed carbohydrates, is about 25%. But now in these natural systems, in the end you are using less than, or the efficiency is less than 1%, because there are several phases of energy loss for that. The major source of energy loss was the regulatory dissipation, for the protection. So, can you manipulate the system so that you can decrease this amount of dissipation? And if you can do that, can you then use these principles or extract these complexes, make some hybrid complexes to be used for solar energy technologies and genetic manipulation? For example, to grow crops under very intense um, sunlight conditions. Yeah, so these are some of the applications that we are looking at. Okay, I'd like to show one example of how pulse shaping has been applied on light bulbs and complexes. Okay, yes, uh, set up so we have a femtosecond laser source which is pumping a so-called optical chromatic amplifier with which you can tune the color of your laser beam. So in this case it was tuned to a peak rating of 525 nanometers and a width of 30 femtoseconds. And then it was sent through a shape. In this case it was an SLM, spatial light modulator, which um, shaped the phase and the amplitude of the beam. Okay, and the second beam was the um, well actually there, there were two pro beams that were used. Um, to control different decay channels of the system. So what is the system that was been looking at? That was bacterial LH2. So a beautiful symmetric ring structure. Uh, so you have bacterial chlorophylls forming a ring here and then another ring there. These blue stick-like molecules or carotenoids. So at 525 nanometers, you are exciting bacterial or you are exciting carotenoids. So it's a two transition, and then from there you have two major channels. The one is internal conversion, so simply a realization of S2, and the other one is side state energy transfer to bacterial growth for A's. Um, yeah, the side energy is uh, 800 nanometers and the other one is 50 nanometers. So from the carotenoids to these pigments, these bacterial growth and the other ones to those ones. This is how the absorptive spectrum looks like. So this is the carotenoid region, this is the bacterial chlorophyll um, 
yeah, B, eight hundred and B, expect to read it. Okay, so the idea was to control these two channels. So um, then they looked at the ratio between internal conversion and energy transfer. And this was done by sending the signals measured to photodiodes um, uh, to a program, so an evolutionary algorithm, which would then look at the ratio of, of these two different um, uh, channels, and then one would be optimized on top of the other. Okay. So normally what is used is so-called from the trace, so frequency resolved optical data, in um, which you see the intensity of your beam as a function of the energy, the wavelength, also the delay. Okay. So normally these very weird shapes um, are obtained from the from these crop traces, but also very symmetric shapes are often obtained. Okay, so that could then optimize this efficiency, so internal conversion over excited states energy transfer to about 35%, which is quite remarkable. Okay. Um, but the main question is, okay, this was basically a proof of principle in the paper that worked. So this was the first time this technique was applied on a light box in complex. Um, but there's still a uh, uh, lot of work that has been done in the interpretation of this because nobody really understands um, why this frog trace corresponds to this improvement of efficiency. So what is the physical mechanism behind this manipulation? Okay, this is something that I would like to look into for LH2. So this technique has yet to be applied on LH2, the major lighthouse complex of plants. So considering again the crystal structure, the different dipole moments, I mean the energy transfer dynamics in the system, is it then possible to manipulate light harvesting? So you have different decay channels that are corresponding to photoprotection. So if you have very efficient light harvesting, it means that most of the excitation will end up here. But photoprotection, it can be somewhere along the way that the energy is trapped and it doesn't reach the lowest excitation state. So can these different decay channels then also be manipulated and controlled? So can light harvesting be controlled? That's a big question. And one of my PhD students worked on this project to see if I will move. It's not in the audience. It's not. He's in trouble. Sorry? He's in trouble. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> 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 so, more interesting in this, you are welcome to uh, talk to him. Okay, um, last few slides will deal about non photochemical quenching, so photoprotection, which I've introduced in the very first lecture. But as the solar irradiance increases, the photosynthetic light harvesting capability saturates. So it's, it um, deviates from the physical limit, okay, eventually it saturates and if the radiance gets too large, it puts closing vision. So we've seen that non thing. quenching is a very complex uh, process um, comprising many different components. So normally it's divided into three different parts, the energy dependent, which is the major part, and also the part of course on the fastest time scale, then you have the one which is more physical, um, motion of the antenna system, so an increase and decrease of the antenna size. So lighthouse complex 2 will migrate between the system 1 and system 2. And then you have sort of, um, photo inhibitions, and this is um, when the photo systems get damaged, they are taken apart and repaired and reassembled again. Okay, that's what I let Now, transient absorption pump probe spectroscopy was used to unravel one of the molecular mechanisms, one of the major ones in QE. Um, so 675 millimeter excitation was used, and maybe the quality of that is not the best, but first have a look at these dots. They correspond to the, the, the spectral data. Okay, we are looking at the traces in three different regions. So at 675 nanometers we are excited chlorophyll A's and many of of the great most chlorophylls. Okay, so you would expect to have a huge ground state bleach in this region. That's what we see in the 
it relaxes on that, on that time scale. Okay, but then we simultaneously also saw, saw a population of uh, in this region, which is the minister of Prozline is too, but is it possible? Because if you are exciting protocol, carotenoid is two is as an energy that's much higher than the um, Q5. Is it possible that they can be in bad forms? What does this signal relate to? I'll come back to that. And then, um, corresponding to this, there was also carotenoid plus one signal, so excited state absorption in this region. Okay, so it means that carotenoid was populated. Okay, a model was applied, target analysis model, and this gave some indication of what was going on. So the base model consists, consisted of four components. So there's one chlorophyll compartment, so this basically corresponds to the chlorophyll cluster, which can relax to another chlorophyll cluster because of solvent relaxation. So interaction with the, with the protein environment after some time it collaborates a bit. Okay, but there's also a pretty large probability that the chlorophyll triplet state can be formed. Almost 30% probability. And and because of the close vicinity between the carotenoids and the chlorophylls, um, a chlorophyll triplet will be quenched with an efficiency of about 95% by a carotenoid triplet. So and the quenching will be almost immediately. So that is the reason for this compartment of carotenoid triplet. Okay, so this signal is not really a carotenoid, it's two state, it is carotenoid triplet state that was formed. Okay, and this triplet state and then also the next problem is one and then you can have excited state absorption. But the BREST model um, also included a quench state, a quencher. So the excitation from this chlorophyll was quenched. Uh, this corresponds to the blue trace. Uh, it's a very small trace, which means that this decay rate, that this rate constant, is much slower than that one. So you have a small population the quench state and then very rapid um, depopulation of that, very, very rapid decay. Okay, so these are the species associated different spectra that were resolved. Okay. There's the spectrum of the triplet state, okay, this very reminiscent of the triplet state. So with the ground state blue state, you know, solid state absorption in that part. Okay, but this blue trace, this is reminiscent of Carotenoid is one, so that's why I just you know, this carotenoid is one. And not just any, because of the specific position, it's very much related to lutein, a specific carotenoid. Okay. So this was then the model that was proposed, combined with Roman, um, simulated Roman spectroscopy, a resonant Roman spectroscopy. Um, okay, so with the lutein carotenoid here, neoxanthin is another one. And then this chlorophyll cluster, 10, 11, 12, is very closely coupled to lutein 1. So you would expect actually that energy will be transferred um, and very often between this cluster and the lutein as well. Okay, now because all of these pigments are embedded into a protein system, protein dynamics control very much of the, of the spectroscopic properties. So if you have only a very subtle conformational change taking place, you can significantly uh, change the spectroscopic properties of these systems. So that was something that was observed. So upon um, quenching, a uh, conformational change of the protein takes place, and one signature of it was observed, twisting of this in the Okay, which okay, it still debates how much is this involved with molecular mechanism of QE. And then the other mechanism that was proposed is, okay, well, okay, on this mechanism one person in the audience is also working on, Alexander Barazza. Okay, but how this mechanism works that was proposed is, in the light harvesting state, um, the, the H1 state of lutein, so this is if lutein is using the L1 site, is above that of the lowest H1 state, so it's Okay, so you will have some back transfer due to the yeah, physiological conditions at, at the room temperature. 
Okay, but the rate of that is very slow. So you will have a negligible amount of population of this is one state. But now, under QP conditions, because of the slight transformation change, the this, um, the X1 energy level is shifted to below that of the lowest X1 state and you have opened up an, an energy trap, a channel so probability of, of um, transferring the energy from the lowest X1 state to the X1 state increases dramatically that is what was, was proposed so this is a kind of switching mechanism and in order to verify whether it is a switching mechanism and how it works that is then where you, much of my work comes into play. So that is then an um, approach called single molecule spectroscopy, which I will elaborate on tomorrow. So is LHC2 really a switch to switch between the light harvesting and the photovoltaic states? Okay, this is all for now. Or I still too much for last time. Are there any questions? So there are. I just wanted to check what you think about the controversies, uh, these experiments that show quantum coherence in uh, the FMO complex. We don't use a coherent light, and then some people are arguing that the coherence could be some aspect of the coherent light was just a side system. So I think work is being done now using a coherent light. Yeah, that's another quite fascinating experiment of technique. I actually wanted to include, but then again I saw, well, it starts to become too much. Um, yeah, so 2D, two-dimensional spectroscopy was used, uh, which is a form of four-wave spectroscopy. Some of you are familiar with that. Okay. And what they saw by using that, okay, then you can uh, specifically look at um, realization of your, of your population. So if you um, think again of it. I'm just going to look at you more tone again. Okay, so, with the realization of the population of your side state, so that's along the diagonals, and then you can also look for resonance um, among the different pigments, and these resonance terms are then the off diagonal components. Okay, and what we could have observed using 2D spectroscopy, which you can get a lot of information of this, is that okay, there are um, yeah, oscillations of these off diagonal terms that um, correspond to coherent effects and very long lasting coherences which are which um, to, to people um, um, that would surprise people very much because in these biological environments very disordered environments you would expect that any coherent effects will just be averaged out on a very short time scale but on a pretty long time scale they saw these coherent effects Okay, so now there was, as Leonis mentioned, a big controversy. So, and in most of these experiments, a coherent light source was used, the laser source. So, was a coherent that was observed because of the light source, a coherent light source, um, or is it really out there in nature? And then the follow-up question will be: okay, if it is really a true effect in nature, what functional role does it play? So th does it really enhance light harvesting efficiency on top of that of the, the normal e exciton dynamics that take place? And my view on that is that um, there was some very recent work of, of the Scholes group um, using incoherent light sources and they claim to, to have seen very similar effect using the, the incoherent light sources. So, now, I think if one wants to believe their work, then yes, it should be a real phenomenon out there. Now, that is, that's my view on it. Any other questions? If not, I think it's time for lunch. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Some of you have been informed that.